After establishing that light travels with a finite speed, 19th century scientists had every reason to believe that light was a wave. Like sound traveling through the air, or shock waves through the Earth's crust, light appeared to be a disturbance in a medium it was traveling through. Thought to permeate all of space, they called this medium the luminiferous ether. Supporters of the ether theory had been inspired by Ole Horner's work centuries earlier in the incredible way that he calculated the speed of light, and I do have a video explaining that which you can see on my channel. Anyways, these supporters reasoned that Earth moved relative to the ether as it orbited the Sun. Consequently, they hoped to deduce ether's properties by observing changes in light moving at varying directions. 19th century scientists called the medium that light propagates through the luminiferous ether. The problem with this wave model of light was that no one could say for sure what the ether was. An obvious question they asked to get to the bottom of this mystery is, at what speed is a luminiferous ether traveling? Or rather, what speed are we traveling at relative to it? In the 1880s, experimentalists Albert Mickelson and Edward Morley set out to answer this question. Their idea was simple. If Earth is moving with respect to the ether, then we should be able to detect an asymmetry in how long it takes to send a light signal one way versus another. Let's illustrate this with a thought experiment, on bikes. Even when he's on a lazy bike ride, Mickelson's mind is never liberated from plans for his next experiment, and he's about to collide with a tree. Morley calls out a warning from a distance L behind Mickelson, but it might be too late. Now, sound moves at a speed C sound relative to the air. Hence, if both of them were at rest relative to the reference frame of the air, the sound wave would take a time of T equals L over C sound to travel the distance denoted L. However, since they are really in motion, what could this mean about the time taken for Mickelson to hear Morley? Very simply, since Mickelson is moving away from Morley's sound waves, the sound thus takes an extra time increment to reach Mickelson. Hence, this goes to show that when the two are in motion in the same direction, the time taken to reach Mickelson is slightly longer than if the two were stationary relative to the medium of the air. So, let's assume that Mickelson was able to hear Morley's call before he hit the tree. A few minutes later, Mickelson and Morley are riding with speed V parallel to each other, a distance L separating them. This time again, Mickelson is heading straight for a tree, without him knowing. Morley calls for warning, but the question is, does it also take longer for the sound waves to reach Morley here than if they both were stationary? Well, of course. Since the sound waves have to traverse an additional distance, this must mean that it does indeed take longer. Anyways, Mickelson and Morley's idea to prove or disprove the existence of the ether was a straightforward extension of their recreational biking misadventures. If light moves at speed c through the ether, and earth moves through the ether as it orbits the sun, then light takes different amounts of time to propagate the same distance along perpendicular directions. So they built a device called an interferometer, with two identical long arms at 90 degrees to one another and a coherent light source, which is the equivalent of a modern day laser. They used a beam splitter to divide the beam and send it towards mirrors at each end of each arm. After they are reflected, the beams move back along the arms and are recombined again before they enter a detector. If the propagation time along each arm is different, Mickelson and Morley would detect an interference or a mismatch between the two beams. In the context of the biking analogy, the laser beams would be Morley sound waves, while the end of each arm is Mickelson. Recall that the interferometer moves through the ether as the Earth orbits the Sun, and so it is essentially as if Mickelson and Morley are biking through the air, just that instead of the air, it is the mysterious ether. If indeed Earth is moving through a mysterious luminiferous ether, then Mickelson and Morley's interferometer was almost certain to detect its effect. However, regardless of how they oriented their device relative to the Earth's motion, they measured no time difference. The beams always recombined in such a way that no interference pattern was produced. Mickelson and Morley knew what they expected to see, and their experiment had the precision to see it. Their experiments convinced the scientific community near the turn of the 20th century 
that both beams took exactly the same time to propagate along perpendicular arms of the interferometer. For 18 years, the community of physicists speculated that Earth shared a special reference frame with the undetectable ether. None of the speculations could be validated by experiment. Then, in 1905, a young German patent clerk named Einstein theorized that indeed, the length of an interferometer's arm might actually depend on how fast Earth moves around the Sun, simultaneously killing the numerous theories of luminiferous ether and changing the way we view the universe completely.